Welcome everybody to this week's podcast episode for the Financial Freedom for Physicians podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Christopher Liu. And as you know, I talk about four different types of freedom, time, financial, location, health freedom. And in that light, I'm always bringing across investors, entrepreneurs, people doing things on the cutting edge, trying to bring that resource, knowledge, information to you to help you inspire, get educated and motivated. So today we have uh, Patrick Grimes and he's actually going to be talking to us about um, the real estate industry, but with a special twist, you know, t- with the tech twist and talking about tax advantage investments in the oil and gas. He's the CEO and founder of Invest on Main Street. And he actually started out um, with uh, in the high tech sector. We'll, we'll hear about his story a little bit later, but um, we'll bring Patrick onto the show. Welcome. Christopher, or Dr. Lou, sorry. Uh, happy to be here. Really excited about it. It's a great show. And I loved your your four freedoms. They all ring very true to me. And as I tell my story, I'll do my best to highlight them along the way. Yeah, I know, you know, we were talking uh, backstage. Um, we met through Podmatch. And, uh, you know, you have quite a, you know, successful portfolio now. But um, you started out very non traditional. Tell the audience how you started your journey through 2008 up to now? Yeah, so I I graduated as a uh, mechanical engineering snot nose guy in the beginning. And uh, I started at a machine design firm. The guy there that was the owner uh, warmed up to me pretty quick. And he said, hey, look, you're, you're sharp, but you need to invest elsewhere, not just in high tech. You need to put as much money as you can into real estate as early as you can. And Batman, that was back in 2006. So I went for it and then eight, nine, 10 happened. And I, it rode me, I got raked over the coals pretty bad. I, you know, I was at that time, I was looking at investing in more like the highest returning assets. So I went for free development, single family residential, looked at developers that had a track record and markets that were just skyrocketing, you know, double digits. And uh, I didn't, um, I didn't realize I was kind of gambling and I was hoping that on the other side, I would have something that would rent that I could sell. And unfortunately the market fell and I personally guaranteed everything. And it took me many years to recover from that, that first stumble. Mm. And then, yeah, but then, uh, what's, what's interesting is now you have a, um, you've got a, uh, portfolio of, uh, you have $460 million includes over 3000 units, multifamily, um, how did you come out of 2008 and, and amass what you've done now? Well, because I, you know, so I went back into high tech um, after that. I ended up getting a master's in engineering and business, started doing well in my automation and robotics stuff. And then I started, now what am I going to do with these bonuses and this income? And so, and I, it's a lot similar to the doctors. It's like, well, you guys, what do I get? I'm getting taxed like crazy here. And then all of a sudden, that voice in the back of my head, put it into real estate, put it into real estate. Just in my mind, I needed to do it in the right way. So I, I, I did what was kind of the traditional path. I thought, well, I'm not going to use other people's money. I'm going to keep control over it. But I'm going to go to recession resilient markets, just like I do today, right? And then I'm going to go to buy assets that produce income on day one. I, but I was doing single family, so I could do it all with my own money and I could control it. Here I am slaving away on the West Coast, but buying out of state where it makes sense, like in Houston, renovating and uh, refinancing and, and holding and then reinvesting and renovating. But I was moonlighting and I was spending my days traveling and doing robotics engineering and then my nights doing single family. And it was horrible. So, until, I mean, but it was working. It was working really well. And that was the problem. It was just, you know, because my, my net worth is... But I realized when I met my wife, I, I was basically undateable <laughs> during this time. When I met my wife, I was like, wait a minute. She was there for my very last single family closing. And that's when I just, I said, I'm going to take a break from this. We got married here in California and then in Beijing, I was on a horse with a red suit with a bow and arrow and got a dragon on it. She was a carrier with a red phoenix and, you know, and a car- you know, it was just a beautiful wedding. And it was a procession, a whole nine yards. And after that, we came back and I said, look, we're scaling into larger assets. I went from three bedroom, two bath. My first multifamily deal was 86 units. 80 units and above gives you that scale you need to have on-site management, non-recourse debt scaled in uh, renovations as well as ability to force rent and 
just a much better asset. My calculus, there really isn't anything between those that made sense. Um, and so I went all the way to the next most obvious choice in my mind. Yeah. And uh, so what, uh, so you're talking about, um, what do you think is, uh, what real estate investment strategy is, you know, best for wealth building? For wealth building? Yeah, well, so having lost it all one time, I can tell you two things, what not to do and then what to do. <laughs> and so, uh, so we buy in recession resilient markets. And I'm very, very narrow focused in this. And you can, it's not being a data, you know, nerd, essentially, I, I'm sticking true to my engineering self. <laughs> it's easy to see in the past where the volatility has happened and in what macro and micro markets the, uh, the, the impacts have had in recessions and the type of recession and which ones withstood or had rebounded quickly and done very well. And in fact, the most stable was Houston, and that's why I started my single family portfolio and other markets with similar diversified employment makeups, not heavy in, in just a high tech or just a Detroit style or just in Orlando, vacation, hospitality, but that have logistics and finance, and education and healthcare. In fact, we have, we have several properties near the healthcare center in uh, Houston. This is the number one life science <laughs> destination in the world, but there's also energy, there's logistics, there's there's a, a, there's all the other verticals there, right? And so you have built-in insulation for market volatility, and and so we have a throughout the southeastern states in Texas, we do have a diversified portfolio of income generating real estate. Now, so we go for recession resilience. We also go for low leverage, which means we use high down payment. And make sure we cash flow on day one. So much so that our our allowable vacancies are enough cushion to even ride out where we've seen the vacancies drop in fast recessions. And that's really critical because we call that a break-even occupancy. I mean, if the occupancy is so low, even if the recession happens again, we're gonna ride it out, no problem. Right? But a lot of the deals we find, people didn't have that. They didn't, you know, they, they didn't recession proof or COVID proof the vacancy factor. So we're finding all these distressed operators because they lo they're losing cash. They didn't put enough down mm. at delinquency or they have a delinquency and an emergency happens. Mm. A finance, financial or natural disaster uh, or a combination thereof. Like we had right now a building burnt down, the property we're closing right now. Mm. And he had a delinquency problem where people weren't paying. Mm. Well, we save up six months in reserves as well as put a flow down payment so that even if the combination of those two happen, we're not on the other side as a distressed operator. But as long as they're out there, we'll be have we'll find good deals, right? Yeah. And so we look for stability and in income. We look for st capital preservation with reserve, uh -huh. and we look for the right investors that are that get rich quicker. You know, we don't try and empty out properties and flip, flip, flip large multifamily. We're steady. I'm I'm convinced the tortoise will outpace the hare. Mm -hmm. And with compounding returns, you can refinance out your capital, you can reinvest it, refinance and reinvest, get multiple streams of income, diversified markets. That is how you build wealth. Yeah, it's quite interesting. So, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, what you're talking about is, you know, you know, classic, you know, great advice. And then um, do you focus like on more on single family, multifamily, commercial, syndication? What do you, what is you, what do you focus on? Yeah, so I've, you know, looking at, you know, hundreds of different asset types. My primary focus, literally, if you look over time, the workforce, existing, existing workforce housing, over 80 units provides you the scale and stability in the recession resilient markets that you get in recession resilient markets with three bedroom, two bath, single family. So rental, long term rentals, and that's it. I, I don't, those are the only two in real estate. And I'm convinced that those two provide the most stability. I only do large multifamily now and I scale and I bring investors along with us, right? We, we bring investors that want to be passive like your, or active investors like I was that want a 1031 exchange out of their rentals, mm -hmm. stop doing the land, the landlord tenants, toys and trash and want to join me as a partner. We can trade them in. That's basically the primary business, but the other focus we do is in oil and gas. And you, you mentioned that. 
as yeah. well. Yeah, we'll talk about oil and gas, which is really interesting. Though. Like like we were talking, you know, physicians, you know, they're pretty much, they want something stable, consistent, something very cook, cookie cutter, nothing variable. So, um, you know, what you're talking about, resist uh, uh, recession, resilient markets, you know, very stable strategy, you know, large down payment, low leverage, cash flow. Um, which is quite interesting. I've been getting a lot of questions, you know, a lot of physicians are, you know, questioning, you know, is this the, is this the top? Is this going to be, is this 2007? And then is next year, the year after going to be 2008 all over again? You know, what do you, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Well, so on the real estate side, I've been every year since then, I've been thinking <laughs> to myself, because in 2007, everybody told me the market was never going to go down, right? <laughs> so every year since then, I've been putting deals together, assuming that the next year was going to be the fallout. The next year was going to be the fallout. So I've been developing, I've been modeling and structuring deals to write out. In fact, in every single one of our decks, it says underwritten, which means kind of projected models in a way to survive or underwritten with an eye towards what happened and eight, nine, and 10 versus 2015 through 2020. And because the idea is you need to buy, uh, you need to buy long-term, not being a flipper, but you need to buy it to withstand a recession. I don't like gambling and hoping there's no recession. I like projecting and planning for it. And if there's not one, that's upside. <laughs> and so we, I mean, like in our last deals, we, we returned a 70 IRR and we're looking at a projected 50 at the end of the year. And like, because there hasn't been one, but we projected 18 IRR and a five year old because, you know, we were just making sure we could still meet if there was one. Today, we're getting to some of the best pricing from these people who were trying to flip, trying to get in and out, didn't have the reserves, didn't have the down payments and their, or didn't have the interest rate caps uh. or fixed interest. Yeah. We're finding all these deals from these people that they didn't structure the deals like we did. So right now, the incredible time to buy, because you know, as they, as you know, Warren Buffett said, when everybody's stressful, time to be greedy. Which, if you're a flipper, you got to stay out of the market right now. But if you're a long-term structured investor that knows how to buy and fix the interest with low leverage and with a value play, and you can pull these distressed properties and stabilize them, it's perfect. If we're getting discounts, we couldn't have gotten. You know, two years ago. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, you know, talking to different people, you get different perspectives. Um, like, for, you know, for long term, you know, for high income professionals, you know, real estate is a very safe, stable play. It's just, it's just when you have the speculators and gamblers, and you know, have these hot markets, and you know, then that's when people get into trouble. So, um, like I said, sounds like your strategy is very conservative approach, very value based approach. The other, let's see here. So you talked about um, this idea of uh, oil and gas as tax advantage. Tell us more about that. That's quite interesting. Well, let me first say that I want to come right out and say it. Uh, I come, the really reason why I'm in oil and gas is because most of my investors are predominantly in real estate, which is one vertical. And they're quote diversified, air quotes, right? For the listener, because they're in single family vacation rental, assisted living, mobile home park, self storage, and multifamily. And, and in my mind, to be in the engineer and the analyst that I am, I was like, there's no way that that is diversification. That is not diversification. Yeah. You're in one vertical, you're in one market, riding one cycle. And, yeah. and, and meanwhile, my family collects oil royalties and I'm in and I know that there are completely different market cycles and completely different verticals where cash flow ebbs and flows in completely different waves. And in recessions and war times, energy is a completely different animal. And there are upswings and downswings, just like in macro markets with real estate, you can find expansion curves in areas with it and they get to hyper supply. Then they have a recession and a recovery. And similar in real estate, you see that in the energy sector, right? Yeah. And because I have this exposure in long term, I don't think anybody individual should ever go out and try and get into energy on their own. It's a very challenging space. Yeah. And I'm going to say this too. Pretty much everybody that's experienced in investing is either lost it all in an energy deal, knows somebody that's lost it all in an energy deal or been defrauded in an energy or know somebody that's defrauded. And it is, it's, a, it's an area that doesn't have a very good reputation, but I'll tell you why. 
because people are not are all just like in real estate there's people trying to do the get rich quick trying to go wild cat they call it or drill in the middle of nowhere and strike it rich ed clampett style right and there's there's always operators that are willing to gamble your money for their profit because they're still going to make money regardless because they're going to pay for the rigs and drill yeah. and so there's a lot of people that have got a quote a dry hole they didn't get their 20 30x return they didn't get anything and so they've been burned so we don't do anything like that at all mm -hmm. and that's what's really important is just like in the multifamily, how we're a very workforce housing 20 to 50 year old existing construction by distressed and emerging markets value play where we do improvements. Similarly, the big old school multifamily approach to oil and gas, <laughs> right? And, and, and we're, we're buying existing leases in basins that are known, known fertile soil, right? Mm -hmm. With existing wells already producing and established proven undeveloped drilling locations nearby. We're farming. It's not like a high risk, high gamble. In fact, the percentage of us running dry holes is very, very low, but we've also protected for that because most oil deals you get like one well assignment and all you get is just the percentage of the profits from that one well. Our deals, we're doing 50 wells. One right. has a hiccup, like we had a drill bit stuck a mile down. Well, that costed us some time to drill around that guy, but. But then it, it didn't affect the fund because just like in multifamily, when we project for a rainy day and vacancies and a diversified energy portfolio, we project for things to go wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And so you don't lose it all. So it's a, and we raise capital as we drill additional wells. So each time you drill a well, like you renovate a unit in multifamily, you get additional cash flow, mm -hmm. right? And it increases the value of the building when you renovate, right? Just like in oil drilling, when you when you drill a well, it increases the reserve valuation for your minerals. Mm -hmm. So the leases are in the fund, the wells are in the fund. So you get extra production, cash flow, as well as reserve valuations that helps us have an exit. So we can exit at a multiple. And when you we do half in these funds, we diversify half oil, half gas. And that allows for us to be able to get diversity in product types. We're geographically and politically diversified because we're in many basins, in many locations. We're drilling all at once. And we're diversified in scale because it gives us just like a multifamily ability with one unit burns down in a multifamily building because we don't even notice in the bottom line, right? Mm -hmm. One well goes dry or has a hiccup or a delay. We'll, we plan for that on the oil and gas. So you're not going to get rich quick. It's still not what this is, but what it is, and from my perspective, I'm looking for somebody to show me something else, but from my perspective, it's the lowest risk way to get the direct tax benefits, which was your question, of oil and gas drilling, which are vastly better than multifamily, especially for your listeners. Because most of mine are high tech guys, lawyers, and physicians, where you can't be a real estate professional. Right? There's like 700 hours you have to get. Well, in, in, in oil and gas, you don't have to be a real estate professional. 100% mm. of your investment comes off your adjusted, or 100% of your investment is directly a tax write-off. Yeah. In the first year, 75% of your investment comes directly off your adjusted gross income. Yeah. That means essentially for most of your listeners that have like a 40% plus marginal tax rate, okay? That means that if if they put in 70 grand the government will see that by raising it 30 <laughs> and then you'll get the benefit of all 100 right because they will if you put in 100 they'll give you an instant rebate of 30 right right and there's multiple ways to look at it but if you don't invest in it uncle sam's you're going to pay them the 30. if you do invest in it they'll give you the 30. Right. Yeah. So it's just, and you, Robert Kiyosaki just, you know, is huge and Tom Wilright are all big names and they're all investing heavy in North Dakota, Colorado, Texas, oil and gas. Warren Buffett th th this year, Warren Buffett just put like 12 billion into Occidental. And, and right now, oil and gas is just simply the best hedge against inflation that there is. 
mm. uh, because of the waning of the of the housing market. So, a lot of different angles to look at it. It is more risky, but it's measured volatility, and when structured appropriately, it can be done. I'm not condoning people go do it on their own. <laughs> I'm saying in these very specific strategies, like a very specific multi-family strategy, and a very specific oil and gas direct drilling strategy. Uh, those where I, I believe can help give you true diversification where cash flow is going up right now in oil and gas, going down in, in real estate, right? Yeah, it's quite interesting. It's like you're offering kind of like a, other strategies to help diversify, you know, hi, help hedge against risk and uncertainty. You know, obviously you don't recommend or not, it's not financial advice, but you don't recommend somebody put their 100% of their net worth into these venture right. um, you know a small percentage to hedge or you know to learn so um i know you have a book um out which i encourage the audience to check out um which is persistence pivots and game changers turning challenges into opportunities and um tell people about it and how they can find you follow you visit your website sure well first to your point on i uh your the percentages on there's a passive investor guide i have on my website mm -hmm. and uh, if you go to invest on main uh invest on main and street all spelled out.com i think we own all the variations of it too so <laughs> just give it a go it'll come up um <laughs> at the bottom of every page and, and throughout the pages it's passive and, and on there it actually has the the middle class high income earners and ultra wealthy how they invest and it does show that the middle class is a 7% in alter alternative investments. High income earners have a 25, but the ultra wealthy have 50%. And business equities, alternative assets, and real estate. And so those, so that's really where I say, like, you know, you want to be careful because you do want to be diversified, and so am I. And that's why I presented it. But, but that's, those are kind of my little metrics of, I brought people back. Wait, how much do you have? So you have too much in real estate. I mean, that's my business, but you have too much in real estate. Put some over in this other area. I did do a book um, and it was a really fun project. I was really excited to do it. Um, I tend to, tend to be the engineering type that just keeps my head really close to the grinding stone and just doing the work, doing the analysis, knocking out deals. And uh, I was get some really good encouragement from some real estate. You need to get your story out there. And because uh, I've left engineering behind in full time real estate, my wife and I have the time freedom now to have to have to, to do what we want with our time. And we have we had the location freedom. We actually moved to Hawaii for two years during COVID. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And so there was a lot of that. And so this this book talks a lot about those freedoms coming to realization and how we did it. Right. And it's yeah, persistence, pivots and game changers, turning challenges into opportunities. And there's uh, me here wearing a wig right before I, my wife shaved off my hair here in, <laughs> uh, in Hawaii. And then there's the, you know, some really cool guys, Bill Collins with the Def Leppard, lead guitarist, Russell Gay from the real estate guys, uh, NFL coaches, players, and entrepreneurs, artists. That was a really exciting book. I did a chapter in this. It did make an Amazon number one bestseller too. And I love the stories. I bought way too many of them to give away. <laughs> So you go to investonmainstreet.com slash book and then just uh, type in the, uh, Dr. Lou into the promo code. We'll know who it is. Uh, investonmainstreet.com slash book. You know, I encourage anybody who's interested in investing um, or just want to shoot the, shoot the breeze on uh, what to do with your single family or multifamily investments. I write for Forbes. I've got a lot of content out there. A lot of good stuff. I'd be happy to talk with anybody. I'm a, I like to network and meet people. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm definitely going to check out your, the book for all the listeners out there. Check out Patrick's resources. He's on LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram. Um, I'll, I'm going to follow him as well and be sure to check those out. Um, and uh, it's been a fascinating discussion. You know, if, if you kind of take what you know, it's kind of, you know, um, take, you know, sort of use it as a diversified strategy in your portfolio, it can you know, work wonders. So um, thanks so much. And um, we really enjoyed having you and we look forward to hearing about your future success. All right, I appreciate it. I look forward to chatting. Thank you so much.